Welcome to another episode of No Reserve, Haggerty's podcast about the enthusiast car market. Now, we're here to help you make sense of the market, whether you're buying, selling, or just watching. Now, this week, we're talking about a vintage Ferrari that was owned by a man named Vroom and styled by Boano, a cheap and fun Fiero, the Lotus Wedge V8 that sold for over 200 grand, and what is perhaps the perfect Lamborghini Countach. I'm Larry Webster. I'm the editor of Haggerty Media. And I'm joined by Dave Kinney. He's the publisher of the Haggerty Price Guide. Now, we've got decades of experience buying, selling, and driving the cars we love. Plus, we don't just guess at the values. We're backed up by the data of the Haggerty Valuation Tools. All right, let's roll. All right, we are recording this on Wednesday, June 14th. I want to start off, Dave. I want to give you some space to talk about a topic that is near and dear to your heart because you wrote a really terrific article uh, that's on Haggerty.com. It's on what I think is the strangest car called the Studebaker Avanti. And the thing that tipped me off, you you owned a hundred of these? Actually, I've owned up more than a hundred. It's an embarrassing number. So I just tell everybody a hundred. I've, I've, I've got almost 20 right now. So, the, I mean, just tell me about the fever. Like the, the, the anecdote you put was so fascinating. It was like, you're in Florida, you were bored. What happened? I was a kid. I was like nine years old, and uh, you know, uh, it was a rainy, rainy week in Florida. I, uh, my dad took me out. We bought the model at a hobby shop. The thing looked like a spacecraft to me. I mean, think about it. This is 1963, and every car had a radiator. Every car had chrome on the front. Every car was ladled with chrome. That you know, the, the, that I was around all those 50s cars sure. when I was a kid, and I was a car kid. Here's the neat part of this story. I think that so many people, so many people have reached out to me about this story. That okay, the Avani wasn't their car, but uh, you know, maybe a Porsche three fifty six was their car, or you know, depending oh, on the age, Dave, they, Dave, the, Dave. the age they grew. You're up. deflecting. You're deflecting. Let's stay in the Avanti right. and the weirdness of this thing because you've been a yes, cha- champion it was... forever for decades, and this car is fascinating. For one thing, I was really touched by your dad, right? You know, yeah, great, yeah. You, you... I had a cool dad. I mean, he uh, uh, he kind of understood the boy in me, and you know, no boy understands the boy in them, right? Because it's a oh, you know, it's great a very, line. Uh, it's a great troubling time for everybody. Yeah. I mean, everybody who says I had a I had a tough childhood. That's you know ninety nine point nine percent of the kids, uh, you know, even if they were privileged at the time, they think they had a tough childhood. But it's it's a tough time, and uh, yeah. I just connected with the Avani. Uh, a little bit weird, like me. Um, you know, off the charts strange, uh, like me, and kind of a uh, you know uh, boats against the current. Yeah. I guess it was it was a it was a you know the last dying gasp of a you know, of a uh, established 100-year-old automaker at the time. I didn't really realize that. Like I said, I was nine years old. But it started me down this trip of learning about automobiles. And, wow. you know, I it's tough to say it this way, but the Avani was my friend when I didn't have a lot of friends. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I mean, it, but we say that in a different way now because, uh, you know, honey, I'm going out to the garage to work on the car instead of, like, being mad about something. I mean, it's kind of universal or kind of... I need to reset my brain cell. And so the Avani was kind of a reset for me. And, you know, when I was able to afford one after, you know, kind of horse trading around and stuff like that, it was a monumental event and I've never forgotten it. And I love the cars, I, oh. you know, and, and they're weird and people hate them. I get that. Um, oh. But they're they're great and they're and huh. people love them. And I get that as well. I didn't mean to say it was weird. But by the way, we're, we're getting the Tao of Dave, which I find fascinating. You're like this. I did. We keep peeling back. But um. No, in all seriousness, so it, it sounded like the design is what really uh, spoke to you. And, Absolutely. And that design is what's the, it's central to this car. And this was a Raymond Lowy design, right? Well, yeah. And this was, a, you know, Raymond Lowy Studios. There's, there were five people responsible for the design. We don't need to go into all that because you can, you can read about the Avanti ad nauseum. Uh, but there was a young guy named Tom Kellogg who was on the, on the team who I got to meet. I actually drove his Acura NSX. Wow. Um, unfortunately, that's the same car that he was killed in, in a traffic accident. Oh. Um, but, uh, Tom Gosh. was a great guy out of, uh, art center, uh, college yep. of design and, um, you know, really kind of helped out a lot with giving a younger, uh, you know, kind of presentation to the car. Lowy had sketched the car out many times. He did the Laremo, uh, which didn't, you know all that well he also did a bmw 507 that is my least favorite 507 i just think this one came together 
other people disagree, it's okay. But it was, to me, for my nine-year-old mind, it was like the unobtainable spaceship that was starting to come down the road. Well, okay, it had a V8, but all that matters is, is the design. And that we're talking the exterior design. Whatever it was about that that design struck many people, maybe, I wouldn't say many, a small number of people in such a fierce and rabid way. I've always wanted to figure out a way to describe that or explain that because you can't because their Studebaker went out of business and immediately another company picked up this design and bought it and kept producing it. And that happened, I think, five times. That car, this car was, when was the last Avanti produced? Uh, in 2006, it was the company that wouldn't die. Yeah, it, it was just amazing. I, uh, the two people who took it over were two used car dealers, or new car dealers, I'm sorry, from South Bend, Indiana. You know, they knew all the players in South Bend. They, you know, bought cars and sold cars and, and been around for, you know, a long, long time. So it became kind of an interesting thing for everybody. They they took the car. Um, they put a Chevy 327 in. And like I like to say, what's wrong with uh, any car with a 327 Chevy from the factory? Uh, there were even some 350 horse cars. Uh, most of them were 300 horse. And the car went down a luxury road as opposed to a performance road. Um, but they were a great performer. They came in, um, you know, supercharged, non-supercharged. The last seven cars built were R3s, which were uh, even, you know, a, kind of a doubling down on the supercharger with a lot of, uh, you know, good tricks to it. 289 bored out to 304.5, all that sort of stuff. Fascinating history, but not for everybody. Yeah, but I mean, um, the fact that it's being produced or it's been produced over decades by multiple different folks who are not dumb people, but they all thought this car deserved to be produced and there was a business around it. That's what I think fascinates me the most is that it, it creates this cognitive um, dissonance where they're willing to suspend reality and think if they just get this thing producing, enough people will buy them. And because there is that small number with such fast and interest. You say in the article, like these are the ones to buy. Um, I just think as it, in terms of a car with a story and a history and they're really pretty great values in the collector car world, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, you have to really search hard to spend a hundred grand on one, and that would be a, a really, really nice car. Uh, other than the R3s, which are almost unobtainium, they they they're going to go for more than that. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of value for the money. You can buy a running, driving, decent car. I mean, with needs for thirty five grand, um, without any trouble. A Studebaker, you might be able to buy an Avani two for ten grand less than that, with the, you know, in the same kind of shape. So and the, and there's a shop. Who's the shop? You have a car up here in uh, Detroit. There's a shop here with a ton of them in the back lot, right? Oh, it's uh, actually Nostalgic Motors. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, they're in they're in Wixom. That's Wixom. Right. right. And there's a couple of places like that that are uh, you know parts places and stuff like that around. So yeah, it's definitely one of those things. It's 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 cult like. There's no doubt about oh, it. I'm a member. I'm I'm a member of a cult, Larry. But it's a pretty innocent cult. No, okay? it's really fun, and I, I'm so grateful you shared it with us. And uh, yeah, it's, it's Thank you. I, I, you Thank know, you. one of these days I'd love to, you know, some designer to tell me what really strikes right to the, you know, the, 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 the lizard brain of everybody is this line here. And I guess we'll never know that, but yeah. thank you, Dave. Uh, well, let's move on. I want to talk about, there's some really interesting sales. And, um, the first one is over in Monaco last week, a, a Ferrari 250 GT Boano sold for one and a half million dollars. Uh, we wrote a little story about it on Insider, and the fascinating thing about this was it was owned by a guy named with the last name Room and Jean de Broom. De Broom. Um and it was, a, I guess, uh, some kind of combination of grifter, playboy, whatever. But uh, this car is really fascinating because it has such an American '50s look to us. Tell us about the Boano. What does that part mean? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Boano was a coach builder and uh, mm. Pin and Farina, two words back then, Pin and, and Farina, okay. um, were uh, not able apparently to produce cars fast enough. So they went to another uh, another coach builder named Buono. This is not my favorite design of a uh, Ferrari by any stretch of the imagination. I think it's really dated because of the fins. This is my personal opinion. I get it that other people feel differently about this. Oh, oh wait, you know, it has fins on the back taillights. They're really yeah, subtle, but yeah. they're very 50s American. Sure. Why was Bono, I mean, do we even know why they were copying American car design? Oh, well, the you know, it was not just American. Oh, okay, the fins were definitely American car design, but it's not just American stuff. Look at this car and tell me there's a lot, you know, we started out with Studebaker. Here we are. How about a 52, 53 uh, Lowy Coupe in this? There's a lot of that with that uh, mm -hmm. roof line. 
as right. well. I I think it comes together better on the Studebaker mm-hmm. than it does on the Ferrari, and I know that's blasphemy to a whole bunch of people. Um, as a matter of fact, these cars were dirt cheap for a while. I bought a 250 GTE from a very well-known uh, classic car dealer who I'm not going to name because it's kind of embarrassing in some ways, not to him, but to me. Uh, I bought a 250 GTE, drove it back home. Now, keep in mind, he's in North Carolina. I'm in Virginia, so it was a you know a half a day drive, almost a full day in my 250 GTE when the exhaust fell off in the city of Richmond. Oh, uh, and I forgot how hot an exhaust is when it's in the middle of a roadway. So uh, uh, I, I, I kicked it and it burned through part of one of my sneakers. But anyhow, I digress. Uh, he also had three Buanos underneath the porch of his what house. What year are we talking here? So this would have been, I believe I bought the 250 in 1978 or 77. So okay. 25 long, year old long, cars we're talking. Long, long time ago. Used and cars. Absolutely. And none of them were very good cars. They were, like I said, <laughs> sitting under a raised uh, you know, porch in his house. Uh, and guess how much he offered them to me for? Uh, I'm going to say five grand. Oh, well, that's because I told you. Uh, yeah, five grand a piece. That'd be 15 grand for all of them. Uh, they were out of favor. Now, I don't know how, and one of them might have been an Elena, which is very similar to a, a Buono. But anyhow, I don't know how bad the cars were. I assume they were in about the same shape as the 250 GTE, which I will remind you, I drove home. Uh, but in the meantime, um, you know, the mighty had fallen, and here we have one that sold for over a million and a half U.S. dollars. Yeah, I mean, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the 250 was like the bread and butter chassis for Ferrari in the mid-50s. And, you know, the brilliant part about it, I know you were scoffing at these things, but it still had that, it's a Colombo V12, right? It is the Colombo V12 to those of us who, who think of it, you know, as like a reverent engine, the 250 engine. Yeah, that's the uh, one. You know, w- w- it was the one. That's yeah. exactly right. I mean, it was the GTO. It was the short wheelbase. I mean, it was used in all kinds of cars. And this was the engineer Colombo right after World War II. Enzo hires him to design an engine. And if you think about what enabled this company, it's this motor. With If this motor was a, was a turkey, Ferrari wouldn't be here. Yeah? The backbone of the company. Absolutely. Yeah. There's no two ways about it. And like I said, I've 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 come off of my, you know, kind of dislike of the body style. Um they're they're aging a little bit better now, but at the time it looked just looked like another old fifties car to me. Is this probably, you know, a million and a half dollars? That's probably about what it's worth, do you figure? Uh, I, I actually, I believe the price guide because I did look it up has um, the uh, in the Hegarty price guide. Of course, that is we have this car at a million three fifty. So I think now keep in mind this is the aluminum car. I don't know if we mentioned that. Uh, only uh, right. a dozen that's of a, them, that's I guess. a big uh, price uh, increase, uh, right? Because six hundred grand would be more likely for a uh, for a steel body car. But anyhow, we have these at one point three five. I have a feeling they'll be moving up based on this because this sold at 1.35 euro plus a 12% uh, uh, mm. buyer's fee. So it's probably closer to a million six, something like that. And this is no number one car. It does have a great history. Yeah, race. Uh, this, yeah, this Jean de Vroom, uh, who oh. I've read about. Uh, boy, did I go down a, a so rabbit hole I. reading about him. Uh, interesting guy. They're trying to say it in very, very nice ways, but. He probably had some, um, geez, I don't want to say anything bad because he's got living relatives, I'm sure, some peculiarities which were extremely peculiar in the 1950s. How's that? Does that sound good? somehow to the Rockefellers. I mean, it, it is a fascinating story. And what I guess Ferraris of that era were bought by the rich and powerful. So, of course, absolutely. they come with stories, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, who knows what the full story is? Uh, you know, I mean, when I think of Dutch people who kind of made it big, in a very strange way, you got to think of uh, Colonel uh, Colonel Tom and Elvis, uh, you know. So there's another example of uh, you know of a guy who you know, uh, let's just say it grifted all the way to the top. So <laughs> I think what's uh, uh, what this tells me this is an expensive car, a million and a half. What you just talked about is if it was an alloy b- body, which means aluminum, it's more like six hundred thousand. And I find that so fascinating that you can get a '50s Ferrari for under a million dollars. And um, what I want to ask you about, that really speaks to the volume that was produced because we just spoke about, they all have that great V12 engine. 
They all have all that period styling. They're all sort of hand built. Um, I, I'm Dave. Do, is there value in these old Ferraris? No, of course there is, and I think there will continue to be. I mean, I, what a setup of a joke here. So, uh, <laughs> no, they're worthless. As a matter of fact, my email address is, and if you're selling yours, no, uh, okay, no. not value, but is there a bargain for what you're getting in the classic car world in these '50s eras Ferrari? unloved they weren't race cars they were sort of in between touring cars maybe four seaters it seems to me that there is well keep in mind that ferrari made production cars so they could make race cars I sure mean, there was absolutely no you know i mean we're making these cars so that we can go faster on the track uh is what you know enzo himself would have said had he been uh, asked at the time uh yeah, there probably are. Um, you know, there's always a bargain out there. I just love the fact that, you know, you go to an auction and you sit through it. You're, you're going to find an, uh, a bargain at any auction. You're going to find overpriced. People pay too much and you're going to find, uh, you know, people who, uh, you know, got a good deal on them. I don't know what, you know, what Ferrari I would say from the 50s is a, uh, you know, is or early 60s is is underpriced right now. But I'm sure you can find them. Uh, the yeah. problem is that when they come out and they get known and they get notorious, like, you know, there's a, a big auction coming up with a lot of Ferraris that we're going to talk about. Um, those tend to go for huge money when that happens. So I get it. Well, super neat car. Let's move on. Um, the, the next one that we 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 talked about this in depth, that was a 1991 Shelby Series one. This was Carol Shelby's attempt to restart his car uh, making empire. It sold for two hundred forty thousand on the Haggerty Marketplace auction, and this was last week. I thought that was a huge price for this thing. I mean, even we were talking about how great a car it was. Were you surprised? I was. Um, it's a 99, by the way. You said 91. Um, the, oh, what did uh, I call it? Uh, 91. No big deal. But anyhow, I Sorry. think the colors had part to do with this. I mean, okay. they're obviously all Shelby cars, so you know they're signed by Shelby and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I think uh, uh, Tony Stewart's ownership and then the, uh, the ownership of... Uh, uh, or the you know the the kind of flagship of the uh, of the the Shelby brand at the time uh, makes this even more exciting. Uh, this brought good money, but I'm not going to argue against it. I think it's a I think it's still a pretty good deal. I think it'll work out to be a good deal. I do too. I I, I think these cars are there's so few of them. They're just starting to get appreciated. And I mean maybe there are some downsides to driving them. Nobody really drives these things anyway, so they, that's not why they buy them. <laughs> Well, not not loved when it came out. I mean, they were, no, uh, they were you know they were they they didn't do uh, you know but, what but people yeah, wanted but, them to do. I just think there was a lot of uh, mistrust of Shelby at that time, and they weren't giving him any uh, leeway. And as the car was delayed and it didn't meet everything he boasted about in the beginning, uh, it just allowed people to pile on, and it sort of hurt the reputation of the car, which I think in hindsight is probably not that bad. Fair? Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I you know. It, I think we had these at the, you know, at the top at the at the two hundred two ten range. Mm -hmm. This is a special car. It brought what it should have brought, and uh, I love it, and I'm happy that it did. I think colors had a lot to do with this. This car looks great in yellow, it's and spectacular. It, to me, it doesn't look anywhere near as good in other colors. So, oh, I think that's, that's a great point. Yep, yeah. color color matters. But then, yeah. if we go to the opposite end of the spectrum, a, <laughs> a 1986 Pontiac Fiero GT sold on Bring a Trailer for 7,900 bucks. This car had only 59,000 miles on it. I saw it, Dave, and I was like, holy smokes, what a bargain. And then I went to the price guide, and it told me something different. Yeah, uh, you know, Fiero, you know, we've talked about this before. General Motors has it. They spend millions and millions and millions of getting it right, and then all of a sudden they they ax it, and there, there are no more. And I think this is the car that uh, that that got dropped three or four years too soon, um, because they were getting the car so right. So the later you can find of a Fiero, I think the better. Yeah, um, I think you want the '88 is the year you want. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, but. You know, a lot of fun stuff in this car, and that's, you know, for a lot of people who are in the car world, that's harmless money at eight eight thousand $8,000. They're going to have fun with it. Uh, they're going to drive it. They're going to put some miles on it. And when they're done, they're going to get somewhere around that likely. Uh, 59,000 miles is low, low miles on this thing when you I think just about thought, it. Yeah, I get it. The price guy, the Haggerty price guy says that's about what it's worth. Yeah. Um, I looked at the photos and I thought, you know, th that mileage is legit. Some of the telltales that it wasn't as well cared for it as you might have liked. I don't know if you saw, there's a whole bunch of dirt 
you could see where the front hood closes underneath, yeah. which yeah. suggests it was left outside for a while because the leaves get in there and they, you know, they break down and they turn into mush. But otherwise, I thought no, not a really whole lot of rust. The interior looked really clean. 86 was cool because that was the first year you could get the V6 with the five speed and it had that sloping rear. Uh, right, not as good a driver as the 88, but 700 bucks? I mean, what do you get a car? I mean, even as a used car, is it's not a bad deal. Yeah, well, in today's <laughs> used car market, of course, exactly. things are things are finally slowing down, so you can buy a car under ten thousand dollars. But it's a lot of car for that kind of money. It's a great, you know, uh, summertime cruiser, um, and you know they're so different. They still get all kinds of appreciation of cars and coffee, and you get the wave when you drive them. I have a friend who has one, looks remarkably like this, and he just loves driving it. It's you know to him, it's a, a you know what you use a Mazda Miata for, or, you know, somebody oh, yeah. else uses, uses their, uh, you know, their 356 convertible for, or whatever. They just go out, have fun and kind of reset their head. Yeah. It's just, uh, one of those things where, you know, the, these very expensive cars get the headlines and we forget that there's all kinds of interesting machines at the lower price of the market. And I would steer everybody to our pal, Jason Camisa did a fantastic video. It's on the Haggerty YouTube channel about the history of the Fiero and all that went right, all that went wrong. And the backstory is far more interesting than you can even imagine. But yeah, it is amazing. And I'm going to give a shout out to Camisa. Yeah, uh, he killed you it. Know, all, the, all the time, people are telling me, well, I watched 73 hours of, you know, uh, secession or something like that. And I binged watched it. I don't have time for that kind of binge watching. But <laughs> when I set the YouTube machine to Jason Camisa, the rest of the afternoon is toast because they're so interesting. Uh, he's a great writer, a great driver, and a better, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, entertainer. Uh, it's just, it's great stuff. It's a great way to spend a rainy Saturday afternoon when nothing else is going on. I Absolutely. Yeah. It's called Revelations is the show. It's on the Haggerty YouTube. But uh, let's move on. There's a car that you really like that just sold. Tell us about it. It's a two, uh, 2011 Cadillac CTSV Coupe, and this uh, this car sold at Meekum at the Tulsa mm. sale. Not one of their bigger sales, but uh, they've been doing it for a long, long time. Forty one two fifty. This is less than half price what you'd pay for a uh, wagon. Now this one does have a lot of miles, one hundred nine thousand miles, which is a lot of miles on a CTSV wagon. I've never seen that, but I've seen it on a couple of uh, of uh, uh, CTSVs. This is a coupe. It's got the six speed. If you can live without the fact that it's not a wagon, uh, it's a bargain. Uh, you know, it's a, this is an unrestored car. It's got the six speed, black inside and outside. So it's got that whole Darth Vader thing working for it. Six point yeah, two it's liter. Menacing. Uh, you know, it, and you know, it's rated at zero point sixty at four seconds when that was a big deal. Uh, which Huge was deal. A, which was of course only like twelve years ago, right? Yeah. Um, but I think. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you. This is an incredible bargain for forty grand. It, they're fantastic looking cars. I mean, I think we forget what a groundbreaking design this thing was. This was the second generation CTS. The first came out in 2003, and it was so uh, uninspiring and mediocre. They, you know, they had shared the, the the platform globally. GM did. We thought, oh my god, they're never going to get it. But they kept at it. This second generation, and then they added the V model, and it has all those cool little design things like the pointed bumper. The center exhaust, it's all blacked out. This is when they got that chassis right. So forty grand's a great bargain for something like this. I don't know what you would substitute all that experience for that money. Nothing uh, comes bat, to mind. The Batmobile. That's the that's <laughs> that's the next thing up, you know, after after this, because it's got that that kind of uh you know, that kind of uh resident evil type of look to it, maybe, because it's uh you know, it it's got a lot of uh it's got stance. Uh it's got a lot of stance. It and does, it, and it can perform, you know, better than most people think. And with the six-speed manual, let's you know, we should have we should have just split this one. That's twenty twenty grand a piece. We totally should have split it. I mean, this is when Bob Lutz was, uh, you know, it's a big figure in General Motors, yep. and was uh, enabling cars like this to be produced. There's a lot of racers and really passionate car people in GM, and he gave them the power and the voice and elevated them to make stuff like this. So I hear you've been talking. This sounds to me like one of those you would park and just hang on for a while because it's not going to get cheaper. Yeah, you know, the, at a hundred thousand miles, this thing's a driver. Okay, 
Okay. Uh, but uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, you could you know maybe if you found one, you had to pay a little bit more with half the miles, forty five, fifty five, sixty thousand miles, something like that. That would be one to put away for a while and have fun. You know, I hate the fact that we all and I do it myself. Don't drive the cars because they're precious commodities. You know, this is a car yeah. that says get out. You will put the key in and let's go somewhere. And I think it it says that with you know all capital letters. It's screaming at you. Let's go for a ride. I will keep my eyes open for you, Dave. Next CTSV I see, I will I will I will call you immediately. But I my, my hunch is you've got all kinds of alerts and spies out there that probably will tell you before. But I'm I'm uh, looking. You're not for... getting any younger. I want you to buy yeah, one of these. Yeah, I'm looking for the uh, for the little old lady or little old man who comes comes into the dealership and says, "I think it's time for me to sell my CTSV wagon." And uh, <laughs> I'm wondering if you'd give me uh, you know uh, thirty thousand on trade for it. You know, something like that. It's not going to happen. It's a fantasy. You never know. But moving on, the the one that really surprised me was a car, another car that sold on Bring a Trailer. It was a twenty five. It was a two thousand and three Lotus Esprit V eight. It only had twenty five hundred miles on it, and it sold for two hundred and twenty grand. Um, this floored me. Uh, yeah. I don't know what you thought. I no. just thought this Blown is an away. out of the out of the out of the park price. Uh, why do you think it's crazy price? Well, it's the V eight, which is the you know the the. the you know, a lot of these cars look similar. This is the V8. They didn't have very many of them. It's a great color. We're back to yellow being a, a an incredible color here. We said that twice here. But for these cars, it's a great color. One of 56 built. Um, I think that with the low miles, I think that with, I think I know the uh, previous owner of this car, by the way, um, well taken care of. Yeah. I still think that's a lot of money, but I understand $220,000 for this. Uh, the Lotus of this era and slightly before this became disposable cars with the with the four cylinder engine. I remember going in, you know, in early the on. Esprit, you mean. Yeah, the Esprit. Yeah. Uh, exactly. But they they overcame it and made it into, you know, an unbelievable car when it was well maintained and understood by the owner. So unlike GM that killed the pa, the Fiero and they got it right, you know, after four or five years. This is the car that wouldn't die, right? The Esprit dates back to 1975. So yeah. it's an yeah. old, old car. Yeah, um, but, but you know, the, the, this particular wedge styling um, didn't have the, you know, the, the kind of full stop, I don't want it anymore. The wedge, the wedge look is gone. Okay. Um, and so I, I think, I think it made it through that, uh, that kind of matrix. No question. Um, and the engine in this thing is really interesting as well because Lotus is always, taken engines from other car makers. In this case, with the V8, they built their own. It was right. a little three and a half liter, flat plane crank, twin turbo, 350 horsepower, super fast. But what I mean by that, in um, 2003, well, you sat in this thing. I drove these things. They were fantastic. You know, they had this Lotus compliance. Like they weren't super stiff, but they were really crisp and sharp at the same time. Very few car makers get that right. And Lotus did. But the whole inside was cramped. There was no headroom. There's no way you'd fit in one of these things. I barely do. And you could just tell like, oh, I'm driving a 30-year-old design. And that does maybe today is, is thought of as character. But I do wonder about that. Well, it's, uh, you know, fair enough. And boy, we could spend all day criticizing Lotus's build quality and all that sort of stuff. They, you know, they they did have some problems there. But you know, we we started calling these cars cars like this benchmark cars. Why is that? Because they're the benchmark for all the other V8s that are out there. They're that nice. Oh, well, you I, mean this sale? This sale, yeah. Okay. It's it's, yeah. it's like a benchmark because this okay. is this is the one that you know you might never get to with your own car, but it's kind of the one to aspire to. So, uh, I mean, there's oh, a, I see. In terms of uh, this is the top sale, the the best car. Like if you want a V8 Lotus Esprit, this is the best that's probably out there. Yeah. In other words, oh, you, I see. you could replace it, quote unquote, for a hundred thousand dollars less, but you're not replacing this car. Uh, I you're, get it. you're getting a, a lesser color. You're getting a lot more miles, all that sort of stuff. And I think that, uh, um, you know, that that in in this case, a well cared for example, uh, it, this thing will always be a superstar. You know, up coming up on the on the show circuit twenty years from now. Uh, it'll be that car that, uh, wow, I wish I could, I could have bought it when you didn't want to buy it because you never thought of buying it. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, it's a bit of a head scratcher to me. Um, the original design, I think they call it the Series 1, 
and it, it had very few, it didn't have any rocker panel, like it didn't have any body add-ons. And it was the purest expression of this wedge. I think they're fantastic. They're dynamite. And then, well, go ahead. You're, no, you're saying me. it doesn't have any body add-ons. I'm saying the entire thing is a body add-on. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of you know, I, it's, okay. Yeah, like you know, like the the spoiler on the on the trunk lid. I mean, yep. stuff like that that looks you know could come out of a J.C. Whitney catalog. And I mean, that was pure clean. That was the one that was in the James Bond movie. For your eyes, was it for your eyes only, right? When it went I, underwater, I get them all mixed up. Yeah, and that uh, so, that underwater car is now owned by a guy who's in the car business. Did you know that? No. You know who bought that car at auction? I don't. I remember it went up for auction. One Elon Musk owns that car. Oh, right. Now I remember. What did yeah. he pay for it? I don't remember. It was huge money. It was like four hundred grand or something for this non-working kind of prop model. But, yeah, worth uh, it all day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, with his kind of money, no problem. That's a that's that's like a, you know, uh, using a Kleenex. I mean, you know, with him, so no big deal. But as they as they had it, as they kept the car in production because they couldn't afford to redo it, and they kept changing the body style, and they kept adding on all this stuff, the uh, the rocker panels, the front lip spoiler, the rear spoiler. I just think it got a little uglier as time went on. Uh, I I think that changed with the V8 model. They they kind of got it right, but those first series cars. They have a terrible reputation, even yeah. though I think they're really cool and they're they're not that expensive. What's the problem there? Well, I think that you know the the they Rob came... Sass owned one, our friend, right? Yeah, he did. Well, I won't say anything. He owns a TVR now, so this is maybe his TVR is a better better version of the Lotus. So, uh, right, uh, okay. I think that I think that uh, they sold a lot of them in the U.S. market. They came out with a bang. And then I think they couldn't deliver, uh, you know, the quality and the kind of sportiness that that was promised on the outside. And I think that may be the best way to put it. Um, let's put it this way: I think a lot of these were abandoned at some point, and that made them even worse. Or you know, abandoned? Yeah, when they got wrecked, if they had a like a you know an eight thousand dollars worth of damage on the car, somebody would just say, "Yeah, I'm not going to pick it up." And so you saw these things hanging out at the back of body shops and in shops everywhere and stuff like oh, that. Oh, so, okay. So yeah, there was a, a marginal value to anyone that needed a lot of work. I think is what it is. The V8 completely different car. Yeah, the V8 is super fast. I mean, at, it, it's contemporary cars of the the three five five Ferrari, the Acura NSX. It's the Porsche Turbo. I mean, much different in terms of refinement and all that stuff. But the in terms of performance, the Lotus. Um, had them all covered. Um, do you know the the writer Pete Peter Egan? Or do you remember the name? Oh yeah, uh, Road and Track, absolutely. Road and Track. So um, we were we were just um, having a chit chat about Lotus cars, and he told me he said, you know, uh, he bought an Elan, which is uh, the sixties, uh, late sixties, early seventies Roadster, kind of like the precursor to the Miata, fiberglass. And he thought he, he knew the reliability reputation was horrendous. So he said, well, I figured if I restore it, I can fix all the problems and engineer it into a reliable car. And they said, well, I got it all back together. Everything's great. Our first road trip, both windshield wipers go flying off the roof. And I thought, <laughs> well, that was a mistake. And he's like, I didn't hang on to it longer than that. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the bottle of rain at the uh, truck stop is always what you're looking for. When you have and I've had that happen before. So... Uh... Yeah, I get it. Um, yeah, not engineering. So th engineering require a lot of work. Engineering marvels in terms of the uh, engine, and then from there, kind of things went a little west. How's that? I've had a bunch of Lotus. They're they're so brilliant to drive. I mean, the steering feel is is second to none. Like I said, they're 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 not stiff, but they're really sharp at the same time. I mean, they're they 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 used to have this test track at um, where their factory is in Hethel, and it was an old World War II. Um, f uh, airplane base, and since they didn't have money, they could never repair it. So it was filled with potholes and patches. And I always theorized that having to test the cars on that track, where it <laughs> has to be able to handle imperfections, you know, because you go to every other test track, they're smooth as a, a billiard table. And what road, especially here in Michigan, none of them are. And you know, I asked one of the engineers, "Is that why your cars are so good?" He's like, "Well, yeah, of course. This is where we test them. They got to be good here." That's great. Uh, so. Great well, little that, story. That's a that's a great story for Detroit. That means that with the bad roads in Detroit, the car's got to be getting better, right? It's got to be getting better. All right. So uh, another really strong price. You want to talk about this one, this Porsche? 
Yeah, this thing is the talk of the town this week. Uh, this yeah. is a 99 Porsche 911 Classic Club Coupe Sundervinch factory one off, sold at the uh, 75th anniversary Porsche uh, auction. This was done in conjunction with PCA, the Porsche Club of America. It sold for $1.325 million. That's a lot of money. This car has a, um, uh, what, a GT3 water cooled flat six in it. Uh, yeah, so it's motor. a 996.2 generation 911 motor. Yeah. Um, you know, here it is. Okay. So we got the factory, we got the club. Uh, this is sold at the, uh, you know, at the, uh, Porsche experience center, basically, uh, Atlanta where, uh, you know, Porsche makes things happen. It's great colors, just fantastic colors. If there was a committee involved in it, this is the example of design by committee where it actually worked for once. Don't you agree? I mean, it's a really interesting project. You know, the Porsche Club, I, I from when I, when I was speaking to them, is they wanted to highlight a model that is not really well loved, right? Yep. The 996, yeah. the first water cooled like car. Fried, fried egg headlights. Fried it's got egg. the weird headlights. Yeah. The the first edition where the pedals weren't hinged on the floor. They were hinged up top like everything else. Big departure from the classic 911. Um, they just haven't aged well. And so what they were thinking is, hey, because they're they're not loved, they're really great bargains, which they are, and here is an idea of what you could do with one if you wanted a resto model. And that's what they did. And uh, they had a really brilliant designer help with the graphics and the color, as you mentioned. They put in that killer GT3 motor, which is a fantastic engine. Still, all that, this price is over the moon, right? Probably more than double what Fantasy thought it might go for, was what I thought. Yeah, uh, I think this is, uh, yeah, you know, just absolutely out of the park. But I can actually get around the, I mean, I can get my 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 head around the price here. This oh, is crazy. a lot of car. No, it's one of a kind. Um, and mark my words, this is the start of people stop complaining about the fried egg headlights and they're going to it's going to really increase the value of, of that entire series of cars i think that the world is coming around to say uh you know this isn't a bad car we've been dissing it for far too long so i think that we're going to see a reset on that and this car is the is the father of that reset as far as i'm concerned yeah i mean it looked to me like what they did was um some of the shortcomings of the car where the fried egg headlights were controversial and they put in a different beam in there, and that did help the look. The other thing was the interior materials. They were really kind of cheap, and they didn't wear gracefully. So they showed how you could upgrade that, and those were the two main shortcomings. And then, to your point, it, you're driving this car in terms of the old air-cooled ones. It is a huge leap in terms of refinement, speed, performance, all that stuff. So you might be right. I I don't know. I mean, they made so many of the 997s, which were way better. I think the 996 is always going to be in that, mm, you know, unappreciated little sister role. Well, uh, I think so. But I think the vast price difference is, is gone, is going and will be no, no, gone no. shortly. So uh, this one, you know, let's put it, put it in it. Let's, uh, let's talk about this in the, uh, uh, the June 2024 version of uh, – uh, no reserve podcast. How's that? So this is just an example, Dave, where two people in the room, or maybe three or four, who really, really wanted the car, and they bid it to an extraordinary height. Or, you know, they put on a really good auction. It was a broad air auction. Like you said, it was at the Porsche Experience Center in Atlanta during the Le Mans weekend. So there was a lot going for it, a lot of buzz, but that's what this seem, result seems to me. Uh, well, I don't know if we can duplicate this result, but I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. But I think having the backing of the club, the backing of the experience center, the backing of the factory, uh, all that sort of stuff is like, you know, it's the granting of three wishes, right? I mean, you know, it's the, uh, you know, it's the three wish car. It's a special wish car, but I'm going to call it a three wish car. How's that? The Tao of Dave continues. Well, let's roll on. I want to move to some cars that are for sale that I'm excited about. Um, this first one, I just think it's a brilliant example of the British Roadster. I've never driven one, so I'm hoping you have and you can oh, yeah. give us a little bit of color. It's a 67 Austin Healey 3000. It's for sale in the Haggerty Marketplace auctions right now. Um, I just think you never hear these cars being talked about these days, but, I mean, it's a gorgeous design. I, I just, you know, straight six engine, they sound really good. I mean, 
Am I missing something here? Or why aren't they? What's happening with these things? Well, this is the BJ eight. This is the last of the series. I, you know, everybody knows about the BJ seven. This is the final one. Uh, this was kind of the death knell that the, the U.S. government uh, brought upon itself by, uh, or, or in this case, the British car market by introducing uh, the safety features and the uh, the kind of uh, emissions features that came in around that time. Uh, the BJ8 has roll-up windows, and uh, the earlier cars would have had side curtains. Uh, so, I mean, all that stuff makes a big difference in, in these cars. I will tell you a dirty little secret. One of the hardest cars to value in our price guide, not individually, but value in the price guide, has always been the BJ7 and the BJ8. And I'll tell you oh, wh- I'll why. Tell, I'll tell you why. Because so much of it is dependent on who restored the car and how well the car was done. And a lot oh. of the times we've we've seen cars that had a very well-known name associated that, how do I put it nicely? Uh, they were all out to lunch on a Friday when the car got finished and it should have been done better, but it sells well because of the name that's gone away a lot of the time. Uh, but so you're buying not only the car, you're buying the restorer here, which you always do on a restored car, but you're also buying the reputation of the restorer. So I think a lot of the times people go crazy for, you know, some of these name brand, uh, restorations. Now this car is kind of a beige color. Uh, a lot of these cars would have a two-tone. They'd have the coves painted white or an off-white, like an old English white or something like that. It's an unusual color for this car. I kind of like it, uh, but you'd expect to see it in British racing green or even red or black or something like that. Um, I don't know about the quality of this car. There's 265 pictures. I haven't drilled down on all of them. It sure looks well, like a how about nice this? You know, you've looked at so many cars, and yep. the cursory glance you're going to do is, especially now, is you're going to look online. Mm-hmm. And as I scroll through the photos here, I'm not a big fan of this color, frankly. I think it looks better in different things. Mm-hmm. But some of the things, an inexperienced person like me, I want to run it by you. Like, I do look in, I think the photographs can tell you a lot in terms of the consistency of the body gaps, like top to bottom. Mm-hmm. Does the ridge in the body that travels from the front fender all the way to the rear, is that all in line? What does the pinch weld underneath the door look like? No, oh, look at oh. you. Pinch weld. I like it. Is that, am, am I speaking out of my, you know what? Or no, is this sounding no, no, all no, like, no, 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 you're onto something. Yeah, you're onto something. I like it. Whoa. Keep going. So I I don't know who restored this, but as I look through it, you know, you can look around the trunk closure too. It's all the same. Yep. So I guess- you know, you'd, you'd want to do a paint meter and to see the depth of the paint because that might tell you how much body filler is in it. But if that those things tell me that somebody who really cared about their work, yes, put this car together. And then another little thing is the stance, um, the distance between the top of the tires and the bottom of the fender. It's not exactly even here. It almost looks like the rear is a little higher, but I think that's the way they're supposed to be. You might know better than me, but. It doesn't look off to me. Let's put it that it way. It does not. Okay. Uh, and it, you know, okay. It's now it's now selling it or, or you know offered at thirty five thousand. It's worth a lot more than that to tell you what's going on in the price guide. We have the top of these is about one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. That's with the hard top, but the hard top only adds, I guess, a grand to it, something like that. Um, you know what I like about this car? It's the same family's owned it for fifty years. They've owned it since October of seventy one. Oh, huge. Uh, yeah, and that's I mean that says like like. 10,000 things all in the one statement. Uh, it was restored by somebody in uh, British Restoration Corp of Philadelphia. I am not familiar with them. I don't know that this was done in 2011. So it looks like a very high quality restoration that's been driven since, which a lot of people say is the very best car to, to buy. Buy a strong number two or a, a number one car and buy it when it's driven down to a two minus or a three plus, something like that, because all those little kinks have been knocked out of it. They spent $64,000 in restoration costs on this car in 2011 money. What's that in 2023 money? Like a million eight, right? Something like that. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, yo. Well, we, it, it, I we, mean, that's we had my, my, uh, the guy who works with me and I had lunch at Subway yesterday. We split a 12 inch sub. We each had a bag of chips. We each had a soda. It was $26 <laughs> for lunch. 
at a well, subway. Okay, I'm going. Well, Dave, yeah. look, Sorry. when you when you live in the most uh, the the county with the highest price homes in the country, what do you expect? I mean, Northern nah, Virginia is not that's, a cheap that's place the county to live. Next, I don't want to hear it. That's the county next to me. That's not my county. So. Yeah, you're splitting hairs. <laughs> but I mean, sixty four thousand suggests they really cared about the car. They were not trying to nickel and dime uh, the restoration. Is, this is not the flip. This is the uh, antithesis yeah. of the flip. Same family 50 years since October 71. So they know all about this car. And that's, you know, you buy the owner when you buy the car. And I think that that, that says a lot here. So I think this car is going to do well. Uh, you know, I like the color. It's not my favorite for this car, but it's what it was born with, apparently. So what the hell, right? Oh. Yeah, I mean, there are some flaws in the paint, which the photos show, some cracking and things like that, which is a little odd considering it, it was restored in 2011. But- what are these like to drive? Okay, so it's in a. I'd like to say the TR6 in this live in a world of four cylinder British cars, and so you have a six cylinder British car. I think there's a lot more oomph to it. Um, you know, it does drive like a, a, a few generations back. There's no doubt about it. You'd have to, you know, to to get used to the kind of interactive driving style of it. But they were a driver's car in in period. Uh, they were what uh, you know. If you only had one car and you you know were like a single guy, single woman, you know, whatever, it would be one of those cars that you'd aspire to. The Austin Healey is a legendary brand. Um, you know, the the kind of Austin name goes back a long, long time. Healey, when it came in, made the car into a sporty car, and that's where we are. So uh, they're fun to drive. I think they'd be challenging if the only thing that you've driven that was sporty was a, you know, was a Miata or something along yeah, those lines. No power steering, a right. big engine over the front tires. I mean, there's not a lot of rubber, so you can steer them a big wheel and they move around a lot, right? The suspension um, precision was not there in this time period, but in terms of character, the way it looks, the way it sounds, top down on a cool evening in those Northern Virginia roads with all those uh, fancy trees around you would be pretty nice. Yeah, they're, they're pretty much paved with spun gold. I don't know if you knew that. We we don't want people to know that, but yeah, exactly. So uh, Okay, fantastic. Yeah, uh-huh. Okay. Sure. I got to drive one of these one of these days. You you probably own one, don't you? you I do one? not. I do not. Oh. So, uh, mm-hmm. I've never actually owned one. I've had friends with them. And that's, you know, it's like a boat. You don't want to own one yourself. You want to have friends with them. So, uh... All right, I'll keep that in mind. And there's one you got your eye on. Tell us about the X Geneva Motor Show 1982 Lamborghini Countach LP 500S project, and when that says project, we mean it. Uh, I love this car because uh, you know. And wait a minute, I'm hearing a song. It's "Come On, Feel the Noise." It was owned by Quiet Riot lead guitarist Carlos Cavazo. So I mean, you know, what could be better than rock star ownership? Oh, wait, that's probably one of the worst things you can have in the chain of ownership. But this car needs a complete redo. It's the first of 321. I love it. It's at Bring a Trailer. It's at $75,000 now. Who the heck knows where this thing's going to end up 13 days from now? But we'll come back and revisit this, won't we? Well, I don't know where to start. I mean, you know, on one hand, the... The pre-1980 Countach, the Periscope cars, they didn't have the massive uh, tires. You know, they really had a clean shape. But then you get to the LP500 generation, which I think started in 82, right? Yeah, I believe so. And these were the ones that we all had on our bedroom walls. This was the Cannonball Run car. This one I really love because it doesn't have a wing on the back, so which is rare. And it has the right wheels. It has an incredible stance. What I'm curious to know, did it really have all the dust on it that they photographed it with? Or did they put that on there to make it look, you know, a little more barn finding? And what's the difference between a barn find and a project? There is no difference, is there? Uh, no. Uh, sometimes barn finds are absolutely hopeless cars. Sometimes they're just neglected cars. Uh, this is a project. This is a barn find of sorts. Um, you know, here's the deal. So I was at the... the uh, Greenwich Concord last weekend. Didn't see you no. there, Larry. Sorry about that, but uh, I guess my daughter was graduating from high school. Oh, I had yeah, to go. some some you know lame excuse about family. I mean, yeah, come on. Anyhow, uh, uh, there was one of these there, uh, and I, I'm not specifically this model, but people were walking by it, and I listened to some of the comments. Uh, the boomers were saying, "I don't get it. You know, it's an outrageous. Uh, you know, it's way too far off the charts. You know, then they then when they came out, they were a uh, 
you know, a decent design, but they, they took it all the way. And everyone under 30 years old was crawling all over the car and they get it and they understand it. So those of us who have probably aged out of getting into one of these things and driving it, like I know I have, um, you know, it was, it's a car from the past, but believe it or not, it's actually one of those cars that will be around for a long, long time. Cause when you see those reactions of the, I mean, I'm not kidding, the 14 to 30, the 35 year old kids, uh, and they are kids, uh, yeah, you know, they, they're just crazy. They were just crazy for this car. I bet you if you, if you had a photo meter, if there was such a thing, we all know what a photo meter is. It's not what that, what I'm talking like about. Like an excitement meter. Yeah, yeah. Like a, yeah. I mean, how many people took a, took a photo of this car compared to all the other cars? This car would have to be in the top five, maybe top 10. Right. And you know, what you're saying is, is that the generation that's really going bonkers over this car is just getting into their prime earning years. They're going to start inheriting money perhaps from the boomers or the pre-boomers. Yeah. Cause we're dying. It's, yeah, so there's going to be a demand, and I'm in your will, aren't I? Oh, pretty sure, yeah. Hey, Larry, okay, good. do I yeah, remember good. to you know, put in my will? Hey, Larry, good to see you. Thanks, bye. You're great. Yeah. Um, and um, so they're going to be valuable for a long time and appreciated for a long time is what you're saying. Yeah, right? This is Geneva show yeah. card. Did we say that? This is the actual- Does that matter? Yeah, it does, people... because it, it, oh. it speaks to the fact that this was the one that they- oh, Okay, a lot of people say they- Spent extra time preparing it, you know, gave it better paint. Of course, that doesn't matter now because the next person's probably going to paint the car. Uh, but it also, <laughs> you also had that little talisman to walk around with. You uh, look at this. I used another big word that it, you know when you show the car, you go, "Well, this was the car at the Geneva Auto Show," and everybody goes, "Yeah, don't they sell watches there?" No, no, but it's a it's a big deal because it was presented at the uh, you know at a at an important auto show in Europe at the time. And keep in mind, in 1982, Lamborghini was, of course, one car away from going broke for, what, 18 years, something like that. So uh, I, I love it. I love it. So uh, about a year ago, our own Aaron Robinson went to um, Colorado. And there's a collector there that said, look, these cars are totally maligned as undrivable, awful beasts. You know, come out and drive my cars, and you guys can do a piece about how actually – they work. I mean, they're real cars. And of course, you know, on Q, some of these cars have clutch problems and other things like that. The whole article is on um, HaggertyMedia.com. You can check it out. Uh, but Aaron did come back. He says, actually, you know, he agreed. You know, they, they do look so outlandish and they sort of look like just show cars for the street, but they're actually drivable cars. That yep. V12 had been around for 20 years by this time. Mm -hmm. That's right. And uh, very durable. Uh, so... This could be one of those like cornerstone of any collection, and oh, I like you know, it. What, I agree completely. What you're saying is is that there's so much room. I mean, a really good Countach is right now, and and this generation, the LP5000 generation, which is early '80s. Those are about six hundred, seven hundred thousand right now. Yeah, for, I think we? maybe you can find them for a little bit less than that too. And by the way. Right. Did you know that this car has its wing? It's just never been installed, and it's included in the sale. Now, are you going to go better. another hundred grand for it based on that? No. Okay. I don't even want the temptation for somebody to put the wing on. They should never put it on. Okay. That's, you so, know, they, 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 you look, if you're going to be a grizzly, be a, I mean, if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly. That's what I say. Put that wing on. <laughs> well, I mean, um, let's spitball restoration costs or something like this. Like, there's no way to know where it could go. Why are you laughing? I'm the sucker that showed up at your shop, and you're laughing, aren't you? No, it's like it's like <laughs> you, you are know, the uh, you know I I I gave them a, a bottomless checkbook, and they found the bottom and then dug deeper. You know, I mean, it's one of those <laughs> cars, probably. So I would definitely take it to a well-known Mark specialist and get it running. I'd have some fun with it before I did anything else. You might want to leave it like it is. What the hell? I mean, you know. Uh, oh, I mean, are you talking patina, Dave? I thought you were against no, that. No, I'm not hmm. against patina. Some cars, the patina is the best thing about it. The patina is what holds them together. So uh, <laughs> I like this car. I'd buy it. Uh, you know, I think that's an interesting uh, yeah. mission for this machine. Get it running and use it and leave all the warts. Yeah. Because then you could really just drive the bejesus out Maybe of it. Maybe put some yeah. quiet ride stickers in the, uh, you know, in the uh, windshield and yeah. stuff like that, you know, whatever, you know. Maybe some uh, find some old LA parking tickets and throw them around. You know, give it a little little flair. 
Well, Dave, I will, uh, I'll stay out of the bidding on this one and leave it to you. Good luck. All right. Thanks. Well, I'll let you know uh, next time we talk in a couple of weeks. Great. Well, it's been a great, interesting week. Thank you, Dave. As always, uh, do you have any final comments as we head into the holiday, what do you call it, the holiday summer with the 4th of July just around the corner? Yeah, it's a good Father's Day coming up. Uh, you know, Hang out with your dad, even if you don't like him anymore. Get to know him better. It's a fantastic thing to do. I'm the lucky guy before my father passed. Uh, we became buddies, and uh, I think that's really Aww. important. And, uh, uh, you know... Remember all those holidays like Memorial Day and Fourth of July and all the ones coming up, Labor Day. They're important for more than just the driving time you're going to have. So take a few minutes to think about you know, all the blessings that we have, uh, all of us that uh, are able to uh, you know take time off from work and have some fun. Wow. That's like your drop the mic statement. I can't follow that <laughs> up, but I hear you. Go for a drive with your old man this weekend. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. See you in a couple of weeks on No Reserve.